Today, I'm excited for you at the end of the year as we close out this year, we've got a special surprise for you. Um, I love the fact that God has called people out of real life church. I believe that a, a healthy church has a couple things. A healthy church reaches out into its community. I believe that a healthy church evangelizes people. I believe a healthy church disciples people. And I believe a healthy church sends people. But in order to send people, people have to be called. And to be called, you have to be obedient. This morning, we have a young man that's here that's announced his call to preach. He did that about, oh gosh, I don't even want to say, seven, eight years ago when he was 16, 17 years old. And he's back with us today, and he's going to preach for us. And so at this time, I'm not going to say anything else other than I'm super excited for you all get to hear this morning. Reed Parker, as he comes and preaches the word to you. And, uh, go get it, buddy. Thanks, man. Love you. Love you. Oh, boy, are y'all. I hope y'all are ready for this. All right. They don't let me up here often, and it's because when I do, I tear the place up, all right? No. Uh, my dad actually had a saying about me one time. He was like, Reed, you're, uh, you're kind of like a good old-fashioned lawnmower. You, you take a couple kicks, but once you get going, you'll mow the whole lawn, you know? So you're just going to have to bear with me as I get set up here. Uh, but no, that's, that's, that's a lot about me, man. I accepted my calling to preach when I was uh, 16, 17 years old. Uh, man, God was like, that kid has got a motor mouth on him, so we better put it to use, all right? Because Lord forbid we let him just get off the leash, you know? But uh, I accepted my calling, and, and through that and through my walk, man, I, I really feel like God has just done amazing things. Uh, not only in my life, but as I've, as I've walked through this calling of preaching, like, I get to see him do things in y'all's lives. You know, I get, I get to be the vessel that, that God uses. And he's like, read if you, I just told him when I accepted my calling, God in my life is a blank check. Sign it and use it as you want. And so that's why I'm here. But God has laid a message on my heart today. Uh, and I'm excited, I'm excited to walk through it with y'all. Uh, it's found in John 18. So if you're Bible people, you brought your Bible, uh, it's going to be on the verse or the screen. So don't worry about it. But uh, John 18, where we're going to be at. And John 18 is, it's an interesting passage as I like to, as I like to call it. Uh, because it's not typically one we, we see preached over a whole lot, but it's got some really good stuff in there. And this is actually the moment that we see Judas go off and betray Jesus. He's decided that he, he doesn't really want to be doing this disciple thing anymore, so he runs off and he betrays Jesus. He goes to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he says, hey, for X amount of money, I'll tell you where this Jesus guy is and I'll actually take you to him. And so that's kind of where our story picks up, a little bit of background for y'all. But I want to read this. We're going to start in verse 3, all right, just so you can get there before me. But as we're going through this, I just want you to stick with me because we're going to walk through a little bit of this story, but it's important. What we're about to read is super important. So verse 3, it says, the leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? He asked. Jesus of Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And as Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground once more, he asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus of Nazarene, I told you that I am he, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you have given to me. Now, like I said, that's a lot. That's a lot to walk through. That was a lot to read. I'm, I'm, it's a good thing I'm long-winded, all right? But... As we see how much that is, I just can't help but think, oh, if y'all would have just had a young, dashing-looking, well-spoken young man to walk you through all that. Oh, you do. It's me, just in case you were wondering, all right? So just not to leave any blank spaces there for y'all. It's me. Ding, ding, ding. You hit the lottery, all right? No. But no, there's a lot. There really is. There's a lot here to unpack. I mean, we just, we just read a lot, and a lot happened in those short verses, so I want to start somewhere easy. I want to start somewhere simple, somewhere where we can all agree on. And that's that your enemy is prepared. Can I get an amen, church? Your enemy is prepared. They were coming after the main man here, the main event, Jesus himself. And they did a couple things. 
they did a couple things. They came with the number of people. So let's put on our logical thinking hats, our, our critical thinking. If we were going after a group of 12 people and we were sending a, another group to go get them and bring their leader back, we would probably send more than 12 people, right? So they had probably a good amount of people, a whole contingent of not just blacksmiths and fishermen. They brought soldiers and guards they had the number of people, they had the right amount of people, and they had the people qualified to get the job done. And not only did they send the qualified people, they sent the qualified people who were equipped, lanterns, blazing torches and swords, to go get this guy. To go get a guy who was not known to be violent. So your enemy is prepared. They went and got Jesus at nighttime, folks. Now if you think for a second, that your enemy is not just as prepared to come and get you as they were Jesus? I hate to tell you this, guys, but you may be wrong. And by maybe, I mean you are, all right? No, your enemy is prepared. These guys are prepared. Your enemy knows you. He's a great note taker. Oh, that one got him. Better remember that. That's going to get him later. I'm going to bring that one back up. Man, he knows you. Your enemy is prepared. But something happens here in these next couple scriptures. Look back with me in verse 4. It says, Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. So he what? He stepped forward to meet them. And he asked, who are you looking for? Once again, there's a lot going on. What I just laid out to you was that there is an enemy who is not just prepared, but he's smart. And he's ready to what? Seek, kill, and destroy you. He's coming after you, and he's coming after you with the plan. He's coming after you with the equipment. And yet Jesus fully realized from the moment Judas left, from the moment the guards started marching, to the moment to that day, Jesus knew. He knew what was going on. He fully realized it. And he stepped forward. He stepped forward. Now let me tell you what he's stepping forward into because we just covered, he, he knows what's going on and he knows what's happening. See, what he's stepping into is crucifixion. What he's stepping into is not the pretty part. What he's stepping into is the cross. He's stepping into more betrayal. He's stepping into more pain. He's stepping into ridicule and mockery from his own people. That's what Christ is stepping into here. But what does he do? What does he do? Notice that Jesus is the first one to speak. He said, who are you looking for? I'm going to let you in on a little secret, church. Jesus knew who they were looking for. This is Jesus, man. Are you joking me? Who are you looking for? Pfft, jokes. He knew. He knew who the guards were there to get. But as I was studying this and as I was going through it, I just couldn't help it. But think, man, what if that would have been me? What if it would have been a, hey, where Reed at? I don't know. That's, I haven't seen him either. That's wild. Reed, oh, spell, you got the spelling, R-E-A-A-D? Yeah, no, I think you're thinking of my brother. Actually, that's Reed. That's, that's the guy. You're not me. Not me. Yeah, that's some other guy. See, we would have denied, denied, denied. Not a chance, Prance. We wouldn't have done that. Some of y'all are sitting in your seats, arms crossed, thinking, uh oh, he wrong. Well, let me walk you through something. Jesus had Peter. Peter's gonna be another character we'll see later on in this story. Peter walked with Jesus. He was there for the miracles and the healings and the ministry was physically next to Jesus. And what did he do when push came to shove? He denied him three times. And if that don't get you, I got another one for you. Thanks for asking. Have you ever, has someone ever walked up to you and said, hey, didn't I see you? Ooh. Hey, didn't you used to? Man, I thought I heard. Guys, I don't even have to finish those sentences. And already our brains start cooking up something. No, 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 I'm different. No, 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 that, 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 that was the old me. 
Sometimes we give not even the full truth, but a half truth. And if it's not a half truth, it's just a flat out lie. See, we're good at that, but not Jesus. Jesus stepped out. It says he stepped out, singular, alone. He didn't have the other guys with him. He stepped forward and said, who are you looking for? He's the first one to speak to the people who came to get him. Now, I want to go back to verse 6. And verse 6 is super important. I want to unpack something so big for you all right here. So pick up with me. It says, as Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. What does this mean? Is it it just a stumble? Because when I first read it, I'm going to be honest with you. I was like, oh, man, dude, this is awesome. Jesus speaks, the guards fall back. He's, He's got it. This is awesome. But this is more than just a stumble. This is more than just a fall, church. This is a divine revelation on the guards' part. See, because when the soldiers left to go get him, I don't think they quite knew who they were going to get. I don't think they quite got it. And so when they came and knocking, hey, who are you here for? We're here for Jesus. I am he. In three words, he not only pushed them back, he knocked them down. Now, let me tell you something about the dirt in the first century. The dirt is not a good place to be. Let me tell you who belongs in the dirt. The lame belong in the dirt. The beggars belonged in the dirt. The weak, the weary, the sick, the ill, they belong in the dirt. The people who didn't have a place, those people were belonging in the dirt. The dogs, church, the dogs belong in the dirt. Not the soldiers. Not the soldiers. So why? Why? Why here? Why this? That's because when our God speaks... The enemy cannot hold ground. When God, when Jesus stepped out and he said, I am he, let me tell you what he was saying. He's saying, I am the savior. I am the one who's come to heal. I am the one who's come to redeem. I am God. And the soldiers realize this. And they have no choice but to not just back away, but to fall down. That's, I mean, buddy, that'll preach, let me tell you. But I have a really hard time with this. It's because I want to put the period right there. Bah. Be like, all right, good luck in 2024. Jesus has got it. Enemy stinks. Thumbs up. But man, that would be silly. That would be silly because that's not where our story ends. It doesn't stop at verses eight and nine. You can look for yourselves. It doesn't. It keeps going. That's just because it's just like what happened to us. See, at one point in our lives, we were there. The lion was at the gate, teeth snarled, ready to take you in, ready to devour you, to kill you. No more testimony, no tomorrow for you. And Jesus stepped forward and said, no, 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 not this one. No, 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 not, not him, not her, that, they're mine. You don't get to be here, go. He said, I am he. See, we get to experience salvation in Christ. But church, our life doesn't stop at salvation. It doesn't stop there. In fact, I would argue it just begins there. So what comes next? What's next? Look with me in verse 10. It says, then, ooh, ooh, then, Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malachus, the high priest's slave. You want me to tell you what comes next, church? Then we step in. See, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in this moment where we see Jesus standing above a group of soldiers and guards and Judas is there and they've not fallen down. And he says, I am he, and they hit the dirt. So if I'm a fly on the wall, I wouldn't think that these guys are in charge. I would think the man above them all is probably leading the thing. He's got it. Jesus is in control of it. He's got the situation. And then, and then we step in. And then I, and then you, 
and then us. And as I was, as I was walking through this, I, I'm going to be honest with you, it didn't quite sit right. I was like, God, what do you, you really want me to get up on stage and tell him that, tell him that, man, Dave, you've got it. You've won a prize and it's God, but you're going to mess it up. Sorry for the taxes. It's, that's rough. That's rough. And that's rough for me to stand up here and say that, yeah, we're going to mess it up. And I was like, God, what do you, what do you want me to tell him? What do you want me to show him? And he gave me this. Where are my ADHD people at? This is your chance. Get them hands up. Yeah, y'all been sitting still all service. This is your chance. Wiggle and jiggle, baby. Yeah. Man, y'all are my people. Y'all are also my example. Gotcha. You know what? Man, there have been times my grandpa gets me with this all the time. We'll be, grandpa, Reed, where do you want to eat? You know, I, th- I, mean, you know, I had burgers last week. And then, grandpa, did I tell you my favorite color? And he goes, squirrel. Huh? What were we talking about? I'm sorry, I forgot. Hits me with it all the time. Squirrel, y'all ever seen Up? You know Doug the dog? You're looking at him. This is me. I'm Doug the dog. Welcome. Squirrel, I'm always getting off track. It is so hard for me to pay attention, all right? When I'm up here and I'm trying to figure it out, you got the dopest hat on, dude. You know how hard it is for me to be up here and not just be like, oh, that's a cool hat. I'm not saying I would look good in it, but I'm just saying maybe in the lobby, catch me, you know, we'll try it on. We'll spiff it up a little bit. Squirrel, I don't know who decided to alternate the colored blocks in the back, but they did. Y'all can turn around and test me. They're alternated. (laughs) It is difficult to stay up here and stay on track. But our spiritual lives are like this too. Man, there are times where we're walking with God, baby, and we're getting it. Hey, oh, whoa, hey, God, what's up? I'm Andrew. I've been in my scripture. Man, I've been praying every day. Ooh, look at that. What's that? That's a strut. All of a sudden, we're strutting. Ooh, and we look good. Us and God, we are killing it. Man, I'm a prayer warrior. I'm up here. I'm slaying it. I'm 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 reading off scripture to people, dude. I'm sending that verse of the day. I am killing it. And you are strutting with God, and you are striding it out. And then all of a sudden, sin. No, no, no. No, no, he was was just right here. Where'd he, where'd he go? What, what happened? Where, I was, no, no, we were, we were doing so good. What, what happened? You see, it's easy for us to get in the way. See, when we try to walk with God, that's all we can really do is try. That's why he came in the first place. He said, no, no, Reed, you're not going to be able to meet the standard. He said, but you'll be able to meet me. And I'll do it for you. So here we are, trying to walk with God daily. But then, then we get in the way. So you're like, all right, that's awesome. We're in the way. There's nothing we can do about it. But I want to point something back out. We just looked at verse 4 a little bit ago. Stay with me here. And it said, Jesus fully realized all that was happening. So don't for a moment, church, think that Jesus didn't just fully realize what was coming next, that crucifixion was coming next, and the soldiers were coming to get him. Don't miss that he didn't know what Peter was going to do. He knew. He knew. He knew Peter was going to make the mistake. And he let him do it anyway. He let him do it. Because it gave him a chance to grow. It gave him a chance to do something, to experience him in a new way that he hadn't experienced him before. See, your mistakes don't define you. Your mistakes are the soil in which you get to grow from. You say, okay, Reed, we're there, we're here. But what do we, how do we, what do we, what do, we do with this? How do we, where do we go from here? I'm glad you asked. For that, I got a little demonstration. And Jeremy is going to help me do it. All right? Everyone give a hand to Big Jeremy. Yeah. All right, Jeremy. Show him what's up. Don't get us confused. I know we look a lot alike. All right. So what I'm about to walk y'all through, or Jeremy's going to walk y'all through, is something called a deadlift. Where are my gym rats at? Anybody? Gym? CrossFit? It counts. Whatever. All right. 
Listen, so this is a deadlift. So what Jeremy does is he steps up to his bar and he's got his weight loaded on it and he's gonna bend over and he's just gonna stand up with it. Boom, simple. Hit him with another one, Jer. And another one. Give me one more. Yeah, it's good. Go ahead and give him a clap. That takes a lot. He's sweating, I'm sweating. All right? This is awesome. Jeremy's form is right. He's doing what he can. He's getting stronger. He's carrying the weight he's meant to carry. He's doing everything good. But then there becomes a problem where the weight on the bar gets really heavy. And if you notice, Jeremy's back muscles are bigger than his arm muscles. I didn't say Jeremy's arms were small. I want everyone to, don't hurt me, Jeremy. But his back muscles are bigger than his arm muscles. So it just becomes a game of how much can I hold? And so we do something here. So these are deadlifting straps. And what it is, it's just a simple tool that you put on your wrist and you wrap it around the bar yeah. And then you no longer have to worry about how much weight you can hold. It's just a game of how much weight you can lift. So show him what's up, Jer. Boom. I love it when he does that part. <laughs> so this is it. So Jeremy, give him one more. All right, now put it down. Not like that. <laughs> Strap back up, baby. That ain't how you do it. You know this. We go to the same gym. I'm allowed to do this. Don't, don't, get, don't get, don't fret. Oh my gosh. There goes the illustration. That's okay. But there's a problem here. Jeremy, just stay right down there. Good, good form. There's a problem. Jeremy is here. And this is an ugly place to be. Because now after Jeremy's picked it up and put it down and picked it up and put it down and picked it up and put it down, he gets tired and he has to stay there. He has to drop the weight and he has to rest. But the problem here is he can't go anywhere because he's still strapped to the problem. See, the weight didn't go anywhere. You can drop it now. I know you weren't liking that. Everyone give a hand for Jeremy. <laughs> Killed it, dude. Thanks, bro. See, when you strap yourself to the problem, there's an issue. And I want to go back to verse 10 here. It says, then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malachus, the high priest's slave. Then he drew a sword. See, oftentimes when we get in the way, our then is typically a tool that we're trying to use to pick up the weight that we went to carry in the first place. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you have ever said, if I just had more money? There you go. There should be a lot of hands in here. I'll tell you what. Some of y'all are lying. How about this one? If I just had more time, uh, I would plant that beautiful garden I've always talked about. Man, we come up with these ideas of what we think we need. But I want to say something really difficult here. And that's that God doesn't need you. He wants you. Whoa, 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 whoa. I want to say it again. God doesn't need you he wants you. God doesn't need your time. God doesn't need your talents. God doesn't need your family. God doesn't need you to have the new iPhone or a new car. God doesn't need any of that because the God I'm talking about is the God that put the heavens and the earth here. The one who molded soil and formed mountain, carved valleys, filled it with water. The man who knitted DNA together. I am talking about God. And that God does not need us. He wants us. And he wants all of us. So when Peter drew this sword, pick up with me in verse 11, church. It says, but Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? See, a lot of the time we get attached to our tools. A lot of the time, it's, it's easy for us to say, no, 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 I need this. God, God, if I just, I've got it figured out. If I just had, uh, if I could just get goodness. And it gets easy for us. But the last thing I want to tell you today, church, is it's time to let it go. It's time to let it go. You see, just like the weight 
You can't move on from things you're strapped to. We just walked through so much together. There is an enemy and he is after you. And Jesus has stepped forward in your place and said, I've got it. Give it to me. And then we step in the way. And we bring our tools with us. And there's no need for that. There's no need for that. Church, God doesn't want your tools. God wants your weight. God wants your weight. And some of us have been carrying weight for an awful long time. Some of us, it's when you were a kid, when you were a teen, when you were a young adult. Some of you, it may have just happened yesterday, but it weighs on you. And I don't even have to sit here and and name the things that you think it is. Because as I talk about it, something pops up in your head. Something not just pops up in your head, but it's weighing on your heart. And God said, no, 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 no. Don't carry that. Don't carry that. I want that. See, I want you. I not want, I just don't want the good parts of you. I want it all. I want the hurt read. I want the ugly. I want the things that don't make sense. I want the things you can't figure out. I want the happiness, but I also want the sadness. I want it all. Please let me walk with you through this. And after you've walked with him, you get to give it to him. And that's what Christ has done for us. So church, I'm gonna sit up here and I'm gonna beg and I'm gonna plead. I'll get on my knees if I have to because some of y'all are carrying weight that you were never meant to carry or pick up in the first place. So I'm asking you today to make a choice. I'm asking you today, right now, here in this place, to make a choice. Let it go. Let it go. Give it to the person who already has control over the situation. Give it to the person who's already healed the the hurt. Give it to God. Church, if you will, bow your head with me. Lord, Father, I ask that as we wrestle with these things that are on our hearts and on our minds right now, that you give us the strength to just let it go. God, I ask those that are that are hurting and are wondering, what do I do? What do I do? Tell them just to come on. Tell them to come on, that there's an altar to lay it at. And it's not just an altar, but it's the foot of the cross. It's what you have done from the very beginning. God, take this weight from us. Don't let someone leave today. Don't leave your seat today. Don't walk out the doors. Don't get to the parking lot and have to turn around. You can do it right now. So come on. Don't wrestle with it. Don't walk into a new year with something still weighing on your heart. That one thing that you can't get off your mind, that one thing that won't leave you alone, let it go. It is time. And I'm telling you, God wants it. God wants you to let it go. Dear Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have poured on our lives. We thank you for having control. We thank you for the ability to not have to carry these weights that we get strapped to sometimes. God, as we walk into a new year, I ask that you allow us to walk fresh, that you allow us to walk with healthiness. God, I ask that you give us the strength to just let go and know that you are God. We ask all this in your name, amen.